Welcome DJs and thank you for joining me Phil Morse for another edition of the Digital DJ Tips podcast. This time it's a your questions edition and the questions will come across the five big areas of DJing as we teach them here at Digital DJ Tips and as we explain in our best selling Amazon book Rock the Dance Floor. They could be about gear or music or mixing or performing or DJing success. All of the questions, as ever, are asked by our students here at Digital DJ Tips. And as ever, this was recorded in our live student chat room. So I took lots of feedback from students as we went through the questions. If you like what you hear and you want to ask a question too, then you can do so by joining us. Head to digitaldjtips.com, sign up for a course, and next time we record one of these, we'll let you know and you can be there too. Questions this time around cover things like removing duplicates from your DJ library, how many genres to use in a DJ mix, the best way to use EQ controls when transitioning between songs, the best way to get your DJ lighting from good to great, the woes of software updates and whether they are or aren't compatible with older DJ gear, and the dreaded sync button. It's all here and we had a lot of fun, so without further ado, let's get started. Our first question today is from Sam, and Sam says, please help me to understand something. I started DJing in later life, now aged 52. I love the technology. I rip samples, I use stems, I loop on three decks, etc. In the last few years, I've been playing larger parties and also on CDJ setups. The way I utilize all the above is to make my own pre recorded edits for such parties. The thing I don't understand though, is that to many fellow DJs, all those efforts go unnoticed and all they are worried about is, wait for it people, whether I use the sync button or not. Why on earth wouldn't anyone use the sync button? And more so, why on earth would anyone care whether someone else is using a sync button or not seems so silly. Well, this is an age old debate, Sam, and there's so many ways of coming at this debate. So I'm not going to regurgitate all the old arguments. I mean, you've come to DJing late, but let me just let you know that this has been going on for a long time, probably long before you came to this fantastic game of ours. So I'm going to just give you three, three points here that I think kind of illustrate this where we're at today with all of this. So the first thing is, when other DJs are saying, are you using the sync button or not? And you know, putting you down if you're not, maybe. I think what this shows more than anything is a lack of understanding about what DJing is. And really it's not so different to how DJing used to be back in the day. Back in the day when you had two record decks and a simple little mixer, Really, you could either beat mix or you couldn't. And DJs who could beat mix got all the praise and DJs who couldn't from other DJs didn't. <laughs> but it's the same thing going on when DJs are looking over your shoulder now and seeing if you're pressing the sync button or not or doing it manually or not. And I think the lack of understanding comes from DJs not realizing that it's not about the technical things you're doing but it's about whether you're conveying emotion to the dance floor, whether you are showing your energy and your passion and your love of music and successfully conveying that to the people in front of you. And if you are, you're gonna have an incredible night. And we have a very easy way of putting this. DJing is about playing the right music for the people in front of you right now. And more than ever in today's world, how you do that really doesn't matter. So that's the first point I want to make. And by the way, we think that using any tools, including the sync button is absolutely fine. But the second point I want to make is this, and this might be 
something that you want to think about here, Sam. If what you're doing isn't making that emotional contact co co connection with the dance floor, if it isn't thrilling them, if they're not thinking, oh, wow, there's a slightly different edit that's got some different bits and so on, and it's had samples in it. And, you know, in other words, if all the clever stuff that you're doing, whether you're doing it live or whether you're doing it ahead of time to, to make it easier to do it on ancient CDJs, right? If that isn't hitting home with your audience, then why are you doing it? Because again, I bring you back to my first statement. DJing is about knowing the right thing to play for the people in front of you right now. And it's about knowing your audience. It's about getting the order of tracks right. And yes, other things matter. The edits you play, the mixes you do, the transition techniques, the way you build the tension and then release it and so on. But these things can be done in all kinds of ways. And it's picking the right ways for the people you're playing for that matter. And quite often it's the simpler things that count the most. The biggest one being the order you play those tunes in. And so I would just encourage you to, yes, you're right to, 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 to think it's a bit silly that other DJs are stood there going, are you, you, you know, are you, what are you pressing now? Why? And all that stuff. That's not what DJing's ever been about. But at the same time, your focus should be on doing the things that have the biggest impact on your audience and saying to your audience what you want to say to them. You, what you bring to the table is your passion and your love of the music and, and the message you want to get across. That's the important thing. And the third point I want to, to raise here is uh, an absolute classic. Other DJs are not your audience. The dance floor is your audience. So frankly, you shouldn't care what other DJs are saying. And it's like, you know, sometimes if you're online and someone says something under a video or something and you're tempted to go and type something back, you don't know who that person really is. It could be a 12-year-old on their dad's phone and you're having a deep discussion about something adult with them, you know, by mistake. And the point is, you've got no idea what, how good those DJs are. All, the, all you've got is them saying, I'm a DJ, why are you pressing that sync button? Well, you don't know anything about these people, I'm going to guess. And so the chances are very, very high if there are other DJs in a room that you're DJing in, that the only thing on their mind is, I want to be DJing now, not this person. Like literally, that's it. I wish I was DJ, not them. And so your job as a DJ is to focus on that dance floor and on conveying the emotion and in getting the order of the music right and doing everything else right. And frankly, your job is to ignore anyone who's trying to poke holes in your technique or whatever. So there's a few things to think about there, Sam. But in short, no, you'd be crazy not to use the sync button if it's in front of you, if it helps you in, in what you're trying to do. Uh, the very best DJs in the world, at least some of them are very happy to do that. And you should be as well. So let's talk about what Java Man Sanchez asked in, for this week's show in our questions ahead of time. Remember, you can ask a question ahead of time whenever you like by going into the private student group, which is the only place you get to ask a question on this show. So if you are a digital DJ tip student, you're in luck. If you're not a digital DJ tip student, hey, head to digitaldjtips.com or just enjoy what you're hearing. Anyway, Java Man Sanchez says, I received a notice in regards to the Denon Engine OS 3.4 version update. So for those of you who aren't up to speed with the minutiae of the DJ tech news world, uh, the software that runs on Denon DJ's big standalone DJ gear and on smaller, more modest gear, especially from Newmark, it is constantly updated with new features. And one of the features that's been updated recently is Bluetooth has been added so that you can play music from your phone directly into your DJ system. And also you can use keyboards. So if you've got a keyboard that is a Bluetooth keyboard, you can attach that to your DJ gear, which is great because it means that if you're a, say a mobile DJ with a big collection, you can very quickly search by typing your searches rather than trying to poke around on a little touch screen on a DJ unit, right? So there's, there's been an update released and it's actually called 3.4. And Java Man Sanchez says, I logged in to update my Denon DJ Prime 4 and I found that it is not among the devices that this update is for. So I've got a couple of questions. Number one, is it no longer supported by software updates by the manufacturer? And number two, is it being discontinued? Well, I kind of got some good news and some bad news for, and you call yourself very unhappy. 
Java man Sanchez here. I've got some good news and some bad news for you regarding this. So the good news is that no, it is not no longer supported by the company. I actually asked them on your behalf because I'm, I'm good like that. Uh, and they got back to me and said, no, it's not that it's no longer being supported. In fact, you can download the, the, the latest update and it will make some changes. It will do some fixes of bugs and so on. But what they found was that the unit you own and also the SC5000 and 5000M, which were released at the same time, and the Prime 2 actually, uh, have an older Bluetooth chip in them. And apparently their engineers found that this older Bluetooth chip, even though it's in there, isn't up to speed with getting it to work how they want it to. So they decided not to implement it. So unfortunately, the unit you have can't be updated, according to them, with this Bluetooth functionality. It is discontinued, by the way. It isn't made anymore. It has been replaced by the, by the, the later model. However, it will still be supported in software, apparently. So some good news and some bad news there. You know, this stuff happens. It happens with all modern tech gear that relies on software. The software moves on and the gear has to, has to at some point become unable to run that software. We've got, I'm sure you have too, we've got computers at home that we can't update to the latest OS and so on. But the point is you st you've still got a brilliant piece of DJ gear there. The, the, the gear you have is no less capable than it was before and it will continue to be capable for a long, long, long time. So I think you just need to be a bit sanguine and philosophical about this and, 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 and take it as it is. Uh, uh, but there, there's, there's the, the update for you anyway. Now, for those of you who are new to what goes on on this show, we are recording in front of a live student audience here at Digital DJ Tips. So we get live instant feedback on not only the questions we are covering, but also on other things going on, which is awesome. So I just try and keep my eye on those and pick out one or two interesting questions or responses to things. Uh, I mean, obviously, whenever we mention the sync button, we get a lot of responses. So Benny says, I don't use the sync button, but I have used it to make my own BPM transitions, which is actually pretty cool. You make a good point there, Benny. If you want to move from a fast song to a slow song in a DJ mix with those songs beat mixing together, there really is no other way to do it other than to use the sync button and to lock those songs together because there's no way you could slow two songs down using the manual beat mixing method unless you're an absolute genius uh, and keep them bang on beat. And so there's a good example of why it's crazy to say, I'm going to say that there's only one way to do this and, and you're doing it the wrong way. Vanessa says, I totally agree. I play for my dance floor, not for other DJs. And so, uh, yeah, it's an old, an age old debate, isn't it, this one? It's just one of those things that will rumble on and on and on, I think. Richie says, I'm an old school DJ um, from uh, taking hate back in the day for using CDs. Yes, you weren't real unless you were using vinyl, eh? Uh, people are always going to hate for some reason. Use the tools you have and ignore the hate. Uh, and the ruckus says, if anyone is looking over your shoulder, ask why are you using this and, and asking why are you using the sync button? Uh, you in turn should be looking over their shoulder and asking why are you using a controller or digital mixer, etc., etc., etc. And round the circle goes. Uh, I think we're going to sum up on this one with Lee, who says, "Use sync, don't use sync. Enjoy the music, and the people will enjoy it with you." So thank you very much for that. Right. So let's move on to Tom's question now. And this is a great example of the community here at Digital DJ Tips, because by the time I got to your question, Tom, uh, you already had some help from other students, which is great, but we're gonna share it with, with, with everyone else now as well. So Tom said, can you recommend software that will recognize duplicate files within my music library so I can easily clean it up? Thanks in advance. So there are lots of ways of doing this. There are plugins that will do this in iTunes and so on. But Sam very, very uh, benevolently answered your question for you, Tom. And Sam said, there is a piece of software which we actually yet to get around to reviewing, which we are gonna review at some point, I promise you. But there's a piece of software called Lexicon DJ. And Lexicon DJ does this. Um, it's a subscription uh, app. So Sam recommends that you subscribe to it for a month, uh, use it to remove all your duplicates, and hopefully, 
I'm sure the programmers would want you to then try all its other features and see if you want to keep it. But if not, you can unsubscribe uh, and the job is done. Lexicon DJ is a piece of software that does lots of things, one of which is help you to move your music between different DJ software because it holds a kind of master version of your library elsewhere, kind of like a big big mother library, which you can then send to different DJ software and different laptops and so on. It's too much to go into now, but I would also say to you, Tom, as a little bit of, a bit of advice as your tutor, you shouldn't get yourself into this mess where you've got lots of copies of the same track on your library. And it involves a couple of things. The first thing is a, a basic understanding of how your operating system looks after your files. Because the biggest problem people have here is they end up accidentally duplicating their music in different places. And so that all ends up thrown in together in their DJ software. And it does come from either a lack of kind of tidiness or often just not knowing that when you're moving things, you're, 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 you're copying them instead of moving them. And there's now two copies and all this kind of thing, right? So getting that right. But secondly, there is a difference between being a music collector and to use a slightly less complimentary word, a music hoarder and a DJ. Or at least if you are both of those things, you should keep those sides of your life separate. Now, this is something we go on a lot about in our five steps to DJing like a pro, which is the way we teach DJing here at Digital DJ Tips. The five steps being, recite them with me, students. Gear, music, mixing, performing, and success. Now, you won't be able to recite those with me because we've changed them slightly. Drum roll, I think I've actually got a drum roll here somewhere, but uh, I don't know how to trigger it. Um, we've got a new version of our book out, Rock the Dance Floor, which uh, is coming out in June. It's at the typesetters at the moment, it's with the publishers. And we've slightly tweaked those five steps, but they're essentially the same. And in step number two, we teach music and we do in the music step go, uh, go on a lot about this and we give you the framework for doing this correctly. But the, the, the big thing is that if you're a music collector, you're going to want all the albums of your favourite artist and the, you know, the sleeve notes and the this and the that. And you're going to want to have a complete collection and you're going to want to make sure there's no holes in that collection, etc. If you're a DJ, you want the smallest number of tunes possible to do the job that you've got to do. Now that's gonna be very different. If you're a one genre DJ producer, you're gonna have a much smaller collection than someone who plays mobile gigs because a mobile DJ needs a lot of requests and so on. Laidback Luke, one of our tutors, has got about two and a half thousand tunes. Two and a half thousand. Now that might sound quite big if you're just starting in DJing, but Luke's been DJing for about 30 years and some. So that's not that many tunes, right? But Luke is very clear about what he wants and what he doesn't want in his collection. And so should you be. For first, we're only collecting the individual songs we want. We're not collecting the whole albums. We just want the songs that we want to play. We might have a few versions of each song, which is where DJs differ sometimes from people who, let's say, collect albums. But ultimately, if we're not playing those songs, we don't need them. And our rule is if you haven't played it in a year and you're not likely to play it in a year, get it out of your collection. Because like a, a craftsman will go to do a job, let's say a carpenter or a plumber with their toolbox, and it will only have the tools in that they know how to use and that they regularly use, otherwise they'd be carrying around a lot of boxes, then you should be the same with your music. And my mention of boxes, if you're an older DJ, might trigger you into remembering how we used to do it. We used to carry, records around with us and you could only take a certain number and it was a way of keeping you disciplined right music was expensive and you could only carry a certain amount and I want you to start thinking the same way if you've got a messy collection you should only put music in there that you really love and that you're likely to play and when it gets to a certain size only put music in if you're prepared to take songs out and as long as you're listening to those songs before you add them or take them out then really you're gonna end up with a collection that is far more useful to you than having a big one that you're out of control of. Another way of putting it is, if you don't know every song in that collection really well, in a way you don't properly own it, right? So we are pretty hardcore about this in the way we teach. 
your music collection doesn't really even belong to you unless you know each song inside out and it's like they're like old friends and you can't have as we all know uh, on Facebook or wherever too many friends otherwise you literally go in there one day and you scroll through them and you think I don't even know who that is don't get in that state with your music collection so a bit of tuition there as well but uh, the short answer from Sam thank you Sam to Tom was Lexicon DJ. Now, one of our regulars here uh, is Mix Master G, who actually writes software for Mac, uh, and Mix Master G's Mac software can do stuff like this as well. So if you're interested in learning more about that and you're a student, check out the comments where Mix Master G states a couple of things that can help you with that. Wonderful. So loads and loads of questions to deal with, deal with, what to help you with today. So let's move on immediately to Mike, uh, who says, I create 60 minute mixes and I only upload them to Mixcloud. That's my thing, right? So Mike is a, is, doesn't DJ out, doesn't play uh, in public. Mike simply makes 60 minute mixes to upload to Mixcloud. Mixcloud being the best place online to host your DJ mixes. Uh, I enjoy many genres from techno, to techno house, to trance, to hard style. And this is a question, and I'd like you to help live students with your thoughts on this. Is there a formula in order to produce my set, or do you just focus on one or two of these genres? Thank you so much, and I hope this makes sense. So really what Mike is saying is, Mike's got four or five genres that he really likes to play, but he doesn't know how to structure his sets. He doesn't know whether he should only play one or two genres, or maybe try and mix them all up. Uh, so again, there's so many ways we can come at this. And it's really about who you're doing this for, Mike. And, and another way of putting this would be, why are you recording these sets? Because when you're making a mixtape, and by the way, the word mixtape means DJ mix. It's just that a lot of DJs will still call it a mixtape, even though we haven't used cassettes for a long time. When you're making a mixtape and uploading it somewhere, the people you're aiming it at should, in the same way that when you're playing a DJ set in public, they should dictate what it is you're doing. So let's say that you were, I mean, I know you're not Mike, but let's say you were trying to get a gig at a local club. Well, you're going to go and research that club and research its audience, and you're going to make that DJ set something reflective of what you want to play should you be hired there, right? Let's say you've just met a new significant other and you're trying to seduce them with a wonderful DJ mix, the music that you choose for that mix is likely to be very different again, right? Let's say someone has said, can you do your favorite tunes of 2024, right? So that's gonna dictate what you do because you're gonna be looking at music you've bought since the beginning of 2024, right? So why are you doing it? What's the reason? The second way of considering how to mix up what you're playing in your set is what are you trying to say? Are you trying to express your love of particular genres? In which case, should your mix take the best of that genre and mix it with the new stuff that's showing how those genres are moving forward? So now you might be picking one or two of your genres, but making it a mixture of old and new music as well, instead of just playing all the latest? Or are you trying to show that you're very good at finding all the latest songs in a particular genre or, or mix of genres? So this is gonna inform the old or new part. And another thing to think about, and I think if, you're, if all you do, Mike, is create 60 minute mixes and upload them to Mixcloud, I kind of feel like if this is your only outlet, this is the only way you express yourself, I kind of feel that the correct path for you might well be trying to find a unique sound that mixes all the styles that you just spoke of. Because the best to me, the best DJs are the ones who get all their influences and that's what these things are, right? Techno, techno house, trance, hard style, they're influences. Somewhere in the middle of that lot, if you drew all of those as a Venn diagram, right? Somewhere in the middle, they overlap. And there's something about all those genres that attracts you. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna argue that somewhere in the middle of them all is what attracts you the most. So pulling in what it is you really like from all of them and finding that sound that works across a lot of them is probably what's gonna give you 
most satisfaction in the long run. It's going to be harder, of course, but it'll probably give you most satisfaction. And so I, I'd invite you to think about that. The main thing I would say, though, and this doesn't only go for the, the way you structure your set, the number of genres you use and how you move between those genres. It goes for the artwork, the way you present the mixes, the way you number them, the way you speak about them in the comments and in the description and so on. It's to be consistent. The best shows of any type are consistent, whether they're, you know, whether they're your favourite podcast or whether they're a DJ mix or whether they're the evening show or the breakfast show on TV or whatever. They're all consistent, right? You know what you're going to get when you turn up. And the best, the best everything in life is consistent because ultimately we like routine. And if you're trying to attract an audience, then stay consistent. Don't move around from thing to thing, you know, without any any advance warning or without any reason. It's fine to break away from what you do every now and then. You know, we've already mentioned it, a best of year roundup, for instance, mix or so on, but try and remain consistent otherwise. Uh, it's a great question. Thank you for that, Mike. Um, that's a great idea, says the Ruckus, talking about my idea about blending everything for your unique sound. Um, I have a title for those kind of mixtapes when I make them myself. I call them the melting pot. <laughs> the Ruckus says, Mike, yes, you can use that if you wish. Benny says, I just posted my first Mixcloud mix, which is basically Afro, Latin and Brazilian. But I did throw in some other house subgenres. I just like good music and not to stick to one style. So I'm glad to hear that, Benny. But I would also say, do it a lot, right? If that's something you've just done, Benny, you've mixed Afro, Latin and Brazilian with a few house subgenres, do it again and again and again and see if something more than just I like all music can come out of that. See if something that is that, that says more about you than just this is everything I like at the moment. And the reason I say do it regularly is that that's when it happens. If you do something over and over and over again, what you're really trying to say that maybe you haven't even realised yourself kind of bubbles to the top, but you'll never get to that point if you don't keep doing it. So keep having a go, get on with it. Um, so uh, thank you very much for, for sharing there, Benny. Uh, so let's now jump to a question that came in ahead of time from Keith. And this is a mixing question. And I'm sure this is going to resonate with many of you, especially those of you who are on uh, one of our many mixing courses. Of course, mixing being the third of our five big areas of DJing, the others being recite them with me, gear, music, mixing, performing and success. <laughs> right. So, so Keith says, hi, one thing with my DJing that is still giving me trouble is EQ blending. In other words, mixing with the low, mid and high EQ buttons, which are just like the posh DJ version of the bass and treble buttons or knobs rather. Uh, I mean knobs here, of course, that you get on old fashioned hi-fi amplifiers, right? Uh, so Keith is struggling with mixing with the three that you normally get on DJ gear, the, the bass mid and high or the low mid and high. Um, I'm struggling to know which ones to use on the incoming track to get the nice smooth transition, says Keith. I would welcome any tips to get this right. When practicing, it never seems to sound quite right. Many thanks. So the first thing I'm going to say to you, Keith, is you cannot judge what you're doing when you're practicing. You cannot trust your, your mind or your ears when it says this isn't sounding quite right. When you're listening to yourself doing it, it's like this mad never ending cycle that's going on in your head. You're doing it and you're hearing it and you're doing it and you're hearing it and you're reacting and you're hearing what happened when you reacted and then you're doing it and you're hearing it. You can't do it. It will drive you mad. But more to the point, you're not the, the, the best judge of what you're doing in that moment. In fact, you are actually the worst judge at that second in the world of what it is you're doing. Because let's say you were live streaming that transition that's causing you problems, right? You're trying to do a transition between two tracks. You're using your low, mid and your highs and you're trying to get it smooth and you don't think it sounds very good, but you're also live streaming. And let's just say everyone else in the world, crazy, you've just got the most 
popular live stream that's ever happened. The whole world has tuned in. Hey, it went viral as you were doing it. There is no one in the world who is unable to decide whether that mix is good or not, who's worse at doing that at that moment than you are. Because you're doing it. You're the DJ. You're in the middle of it. You cannot step aside from something that you are part of and look into it objectively from the outside. Not unless you've got some amazing way of hovering outside your own body and looking in at yourself as you're doing something. And if you have, I'd like some of those drugs that you're on pretty please, right? So you can't do it. It's impossible. So this is the, this is the solution. Record your practice sessions. Before you do any DJ practice at all, press the record button in your DJ software or on your DJ system. Because two things will happen. One, you'll get really self-conscious and you will be like even more worried about your DJing. But two, just like in, you know, reality TV where Big Brother has got cameras everywhere and they all forget the cameras are on them at some point. Their guards go down in the end. So will yours. If you make this something you do every time you practice, in the end, you'll hit record and you'll forget you hit record the second that you did it, right? So now you're recording your DJ sets, but you don't care. That's where we want to get you to. Now you're going to practice your transitions and so on. And you're going to listen back to the recordings, not immediately, but the next day. And so here's how here's a really good way of doing it. When you when you have an hour to practice, right? Get your music up, do what you want to do, practice transitions, do the technical stuff. But at the end of that hour, put some time aside to do a DJ mix, to pretend you have got a live audience and to mix two, three, four, ten songs, whatever you've got time for. And if you go wrong, don't stop. Don't think it's a video game where you get an extra life and you can go back to the beginning. You can't do that. You couldn't do that in a real DJ gig. So this is helping you to practice for playing in public as well. But the point is we want you to carry on to mix those songs together without a break. And then the next day, just listen back to that part of the, of the recording, right? Do it on your lunch hour at work, do it at the gym, do it while you're cooking for the family. I had a meeting yesterday with someone in this industry and he had his phone propped up and was cooking, uh, chopping up vegetables while chatting to me. And I, I've got a good feeling from that. Like, listen to your mixes while you're doing something else. The point is you're then listening to them like everyone else in the world was listening to them on our imaginary, highly viral live stream, right? They weren't doing the DJing. They were listening and guess what? They were probably doing something else as well. They weren't sat there in a perfect DJ environment just listening to everything you did with a pen and paper thinking, hmm, did that hi-hat come out eight bars too early and was it too loud when it came in? They weren't doing that. They were just listening to your mix and that's what you're doing when you do what I say and just listen to it the next day. Again, you'll get used to doing it. And what you'll realise then, and at first it's going to blow your mind, is that the transitions that you thought were, were, were poor, that weren't smooth, that some of them are really good. And in fact, you might even miss them and have to rewind. And there'll be other things that you were quite proud of and you, you, know, you think, actually, that didn't work. Because that's how it is, really. And you start to think, oh, well, in that case, maybe when I worry about this, I needn't worry about it. Instead, I should have been worrying about that and so on. And actually, it was the fact that those two songs don't go well together. That was the real problem there, not my lows, mids and highs and so on. So that's the biggest piece of advice I can give you here. Now, the second piece of advice is you ought to think about what complements what else in the mix. And what I mean by this is, that if you imagine music going from the very lowest notes to the very highest notes, right? Down at the very bottom, the lowest notes, we've got our kick drum pumping away and we've got our bass line. In the middle, we've got our vocals, we've got our main instruments and, when, and our snare drums are starting to come in. They're a little bit towards the top end of the middle. And then as we go out of the middle frequencies to the high frequencies, we're getting the, the crispier parts of those snares and we're getting the high hats uh, and we're getting the very high um, shimmery noises that are right at the top of the frequency spectrum, right? So what you should be thinking is, what is going on in the two songs I'm trying to mix and what is clashing? The biggest thing that clashes is the bass, right? That's why DJs often, and a lot of DJs, this is the, the way they default to mixing. 
they'll only have one base EQ turned up at once and they'll swap the base EQs over, right, from one to the other. It's a great way of taking most of the power from one song to another because most of the power is in the bass, right? So the song with the bass that's up is the one that's generally dominating the mix. And then you're thinking about what's going on in the mid range and the highs. Now, if the highs haven't come in on the new song yet, if there's no hi-hats and there's no cymbals and there's no snare drums, it's just a kick drum and a bass line, well, it doesn't matter what's going on on those EQs because there's nothing there anyway. And conversely, if the, the incoming song has got a big, bright piano line holding up those mid frequencies, and the old song has also got something going on in those mid frequencies, then it's probably best not to have both of those turned up. So it's a case of, of seeing what's going on in the songs. And a good way of looking at this is to look at the waveforms on your screen. Because if you're using a modern DJ setup, that it will have waveforms and you can have it set to three frequency, which will give you three colors, which represent the three EQs. And some of them, you can even have the colors change when you move the EQs. I don't recommend that you do that necessarily. But just by looking at the EQs, you can see uh, which ones are going to change something in the mix and which ones aren't by looking at the colors on the waveforms. So doing all that will help as well. And I was going to say, have a go at stems mixing as well, where you can turn off the bass, the vocals, the melodies, and so on and the drums and swap those elements between the songs. But I think there's probably enough for you to be getting on with already, Keith, without worrying about the amazing new stems features <laughs> that have been added. But anyway, uh, I'm sure we've got some, uh, some, some comments on that as well um, coming in live. So Camilla says, that is really good advice in recording yourself when mixing. It helps you to be more confident and to learn more quicker as well. I totally agree with you. It does help you to learn uh, a lot faster as well there as well. Um, so thank you for adding that to our list of comments here as well. And one from the previous question, um, don't approach genres. Remember we were talking uh, about Mike and his 60 minute mixes. Don't approach genres as something absolute. It's really relative. Um, for instance, this is some ATGR, AKA Mixmaster G. I'm very old school. And back then everything was four on the floor. In other words, thud, 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 thud. It was all disco, basically, um, unless it was new and then it was house. So now we had house and disco. But guess what? They're still very similar. Tag the genres in a way that works for you and don't get too hung up on them. Uh, that's a very good point. I was going to say to Mike, you know, to Mike, you couldn't get more different than techno, tech house, trance and hardstyle. But to a lot of people, you're talking about music that sounds very, very similar in the first place there. And I guess one of the things that happens here is that we try to please our imaginary DJ audience rather than to try and please ourselves. And we're a bit worried that if we do something different, people will kind of say, oh, you can't do that. Uh, and um, it's it's a mistake, really. We should be playing for ourselves uh, and not for anyone else. Uh, right. So I'm going to move on to a question that came in from Frank, and this is completely different to everything we've talked about so far, because this is about DJ lighting. So if we have any DJ lighting student experts uh, on this week's show, this is your chance to put your hand up. You don't have to do it literally. You can just type away uh, and share with us some views on this, because I've got to um, I've got to fess up. I'm no expert on DJ lighting. We have taught lighting here, of course, but we've taught very basic stuff. So Frank is trying to move past basic. Frank says, I'm a semi pro. I've got my own gear for mobile gigs. Uh, I've got a engine DJ setup, which has got a compatibility with a lighting system that's called sound switch. It has indeed sound switch is extremely a uh, powerful way of controlling your lights uh, and having them work with the music in an intelligent way rather than in a in a kind of flash along way. Um, so Frank says, look, it's quite nice, but it's it's not currently it's not currently any more than nice. It's just nice. Uh, I've also gone the other route and got some um, some DMX control, which is kind of the old school way of controlling lights again, just to play with. And again, because Frank actually has a separate DJ system that can't use the setup that he's bought that I just described. So he's kind of got two ways of doing it. Uh, and he says, uh, I'm, I'm, tr I'm struggling with either of them to get to the next level. I want my lights to look amazing and awesome rather than just nice. So what can I do to get to the next level? Um, so 
it's an interesting one. And the three things I'd say here, Frank, are um, firstly, have you got the right lights? Do you understand what lights can give the best show? Because not all DJ lights are the same, of course. We can have lights that are designed to make the room look good. We can have lights that shine on the dance floor itself and we can have lights that shine on people. And these are all different types of lights. So this is where my knowledge kind of ends and where I'm not the best person to advise you. But I would say that you should look at the blend of lights you've got because if you've got the best tech in the world controlling those lights but the lights themselves aren't doing the job you need then you can see that there's a shortfall there so my second piece of advice is going to help you with that and that is watch other people who've got great light shows and try and replicate try and understand what they're doing and replicate it a lot of djs share their light shows on youtube for instance but far better than that you know go to clubs go to live shows go to other djs events and see what they're using and what they're doing a lot of people will talk to you if you ask, right? So ask questions there. And the third thing, and you're quite right, Frank, here, is yes, you should learn either of the systems you've bought or even both of them. You should geek out and learn them because ultimately that's where the wins are. The wins are in understanding how to use them properly. But I think it's informed by the first things as well, you know, getting the gear right, but also knowing what you're trying to do, which you, you don't know what you don't know until you find out, right? So, the, you know, we always teach this. Uh, part of what we do for free on, you know, on Digital DJ Tips on our website is kind of educate people in, in what you can achieve as a DJ, what you can do, what is out there, how it should be done properly, because then they know what they don't know, right? Because <laughs> a lot of people, they don't even understand what it is they're missing. Uh, and you can't learn until you kind of get that right. Uh, and then, of course, our, our course is going into a lot of detail in once you know what you don't know, making sure that you, you learn it. So, yeah, I hope that helps, Frank. As I say, I'm, I'm no expert on, on lighting for sure. But if anyone wants to help Frank, then please do, uh, do, do jump into the, into the chat if you're a student and you're, you're in our group as we, as we do this live and give Frank some help there. Any lighting experts, we always have someone uh, who can help better than I can when it comes to these kind of questions. The next question we've got, which is uh, from John, is actually about our, our DJ courses. And John says, this is more of a statement than a question. John, uh, we can take statements here as well, especially if they help other people. Uh, John says, uh, browsing the content of some of your courses as you explain it on your website, I sometimes see specific modules of courses that I think would be of particular interest to me. However, I wouldn't want to purchase the entire course for just one or two modules. I would have loved the ability to be able to select specific sections of your courses and then custom pay based on those selections. Uh, I believe that this option would maximise the value both for you and the students. Uh, for your information, I'm not new to DJing. I have been DJing since the 90s. I even took a college level course in DJing. Oh, good on you. Uh, John, and great that you could take a course in DJing even, even when you did. So uh, awesome. Thank you for the question. So we do get asked this every now and then, John, and uh, you know we're very clear about why, why things are this way. Our courses are designed to be standalone, right? To get you an outcome that we state at the beginning of the course. So if we sell you a course on mixing for mobile and wedding DJs, then the idea is that you're a mobile and wedding DJ who wants to learn to mix in the way that we promise you at the beginning of the course. If we have a course on making mixtapes, then the idea is that we want you to be able to go from not knowing how to make a great mix to knowing how to make great mixes at the end of it. If we have a course called the Complete DJ Course, which we do, it's our flagship course, which teaches you the five big areas of DJing, gear, music, mixing, performing, and success, then we guarantee you that by the end of that course, you will have had a, a crash course in all those areas so you can go from wherever you are now to knowing how to be a competent DJ today using modern DJ equipment and gear and so on, right? And yes, these modules within these courses do look attractive. Like for instance, in the Complete DJ course, there's a module called Music and Mixing. Well, if you think I, I'm, I understand my gear and I don't really need much help promoting myself, but I do like the look of that module. You might think, well, actually, I, uh, I'd just like to buy that one, but it doesn't 
work that way because these courses are designed to get one outcome. So we will only give you the things in that module that suit the outcome of the course, right? So that will not be an exhaustive module on music and mixing because it's not what that particular course is about. And I could give you the same argument for any module in any of our courses. They're designed to get you an outcome. And the best way you can choose a course from us is to look through the, the, the material we give you on the website, choose what best suits where you want to be next, where you most need help next, and go for it. And no, of course, I don't, I'm not your individual tutor. You're not, this isn't one-on-one -on -one training. It would cost far too much um, to students to be able to get that kind of training from, from me. So we can't do it that way. We'd much rather sell courses at a price which is more affordable for more people. And it does mean there's gonna be stuff that you don't need help with so much. But one of the things that students tell us underneath the lessons in our courses, all of our courses have feedback underneath where you can ask questions and get help. One of the things our students tell us is, I didn't think I needed help with this, but I actually learned something new. Or they say something like, I actually am already doing everything I saw in that lesson, and it's given me a real confidence boost to know that I'm doing it right. So we we were, when we first started, we've been doing this for 14 years now at the time of time of recording this, we were at the beginning of making these courses also kind of thinking people might feel the way you feel, John. But we very quickly realised by looking at student comments and feedback that actually most people got an awful lot of value from, from the whole thing that they didn't think they were going to get. Uh, and of course, I have to tell you, remind you that we are, as far as I know, the only DJ school anywhere that gives you a year to try something. And if it's not for you, you can just ask for your money back. Simple. We, we, we don't want you to have it unless you feel you've got the value uh, that you that you were looking for. In other words, unless you feel it was worth what you paid for it. So that's kind of how it works here. So, uh, so that would be my advice to you, John. But thank you for the question. I'm sure it would help other people as well. So that's where we're going to leave it today. Thank you for joining the discussion to all of our students and to you for joining us here on the podcast. If you want to become a Digital DJ Tips student and join in the next time we do this, then come and check out what we do and all of our DJ courses at digitaldjtips.com. Remember, all of the questions you've heard today were asked by our community and this podcast is supported and paid for by our Digital DJ Tips students. Meanwhile, get good, get out there and make the moments and I'll see you again next time. Until then, goodbye.